Hello, Maverick fans. Welcome to another edition of the Mav Puck Cast. Thanks for tuning in. John, are you ready to talk some hockey? I am always ready to talk UNO hockey. And uh, for six months a year, we do it every weekend on this podcast. Uh, up front, I want to give a plug to our official merchandise uh, supplier this season for the Mav Puck Cast, Lawler's Custom Sportswear. Uh, if fans were out at the season opening series against Niagara, which we are going to talk about here in a moment, uh, and you went by Lawler's booth, they've got a lot of great merchandise for this season. As always, for all of your UNO hockey merchandise needs, be sure to check out uh, Lawler'sCustom.com, visit the store on 84th Street, visit the booth at UNO Hockey Games. We had an exciting series against the Niagara Purple Eagles this weekend. Jason, you know, it was interesting. Normally with these kind of non-conference series, they kind of rotate. So one season you play at your home and then the next season you play there or vice versa. We played both series against Niagara at Baxter Arena the last two seasons. So I don't know what that is all about, but uh, exciting to get some home hockey here to start the season. Uh, the first few series are going to be at Baxter Arena. So we're going to see a lot of UNO the next uh, the next month or so. But going into that Friday game, I know you and I, we were cautiously optimistic about UNO's chances. But after getting swept by Niagara last season, we weren't taking anything for granted. We were concerned after the exhibition that you and I both attended up at Mankato last weekend about the team's uh, offensive uh, offensive chances. But uh, boy, the team came out buzzing in that first period. And 220 into the first, freshman Tanner Ludke gets the first goal of the game, first goal of the regular season for UNO, and his first goal in collegiate hockey. Uh, what did you think about Ludke's first goal? I think I, I texted one of my friends. I said, Ad, as advertised, uh, after he scored that, because, you know, we talked about him coming in and, you know, what we lost with uh, with transfers and with our seniors and stuff. You know, UNO you broke it down great last week on the podcast. Like, UNO needed goals from somewhere. And, you know, he's a talented kid coming in, so we expect a lot. Uh, of him, you know, in that department. And so to see him waste no time contributing there was a uh, was a pleasant sight to see for you. And Absolutely. Niagara goalie Jarrett Fisk had a horrible turnover. Um, he passed it right to Tanner. So Tanner took advantage of that. Uh, like you said, great to see him get off to a great start this season. Uh, we expect a lot of big things from him. Scoring didn't stop there. 505 in the first. Zach Erdahl on his birthday. The birthday boy gets his uh, first goal as a Maverick um, with an assist uh, to Ludke. Uh, great to see those transfer players, Jason, having success. Uh, Erdahl transferred here from Wisconsin. Was not a statistical giant with Wisconsin. Was not a statistical giant with the Lincoln Stars in the USHL. But UNO's had success with transfer players, turning them into productive players uh, offensively on the ice. And it was great to see Zach get his uh, uh, first goal as Maverick. Yeah, you when you bring kids in like that off the portal, you're you're really looking at them saying, you know, they didn't fit with their old club. And so we think we can get more out of them in you know in our system in the way that we play in the culture that we've created you know something about about UNO in theory should be the reason why they're expecting him to do more than what he's done um, in the past and so it's one game we'll see where it goes but uh, a lot of, I was I was really impressed not just with him but with some of the other transfers as well um, really kind of showing showing that they're willing to come here and contribute right away. It looked Ni like Niagara was going to make a game of it there for a while. 11.05 uh, in the first, uh, Carter Ranclev, who we highlighted on last week's episode of the Mav Puckcast, puts Niagara on the board. It's 2-1 to one at that point, but about four or five minutes later, uh, one of those transfers that you were uh, referring to, Jason, Dominic Vidoli, the big defenseman uh, who transferred uh, to Omaha from Ohio State, gets his first goal in a Maverick uniform. 
uh, with assists to uh, Victor Mancini and Ray Fust. Uh, great to see Badoli get that goal. And I was uh, I was impressed with uh, Mancini all weekend long, Jason. The defense in general played really well this weekend. Um, you know, there's they contributed offensively, kept mistakes to a minimum. You know, they made a few, but but none of the like last year we had some of those those massive glaring like you should know better at this level than to never do things like that and you know they they seemed composed and that um that's what we need out of them that's this team's going to rely on them being smart moving the puck uh making sure that they're you know pushing from inside out um you know those types of things and you know i was kind of until that um goal by vidoli like i was kind of worried like i'm like not they're hanging in there. It's one of those, like, it's going to be a close game. You know, we're uh, <laughs> we're going to lose it late on some ridiculous mental mistake. We've done that before in the past. And, like, I was worried about that going after the first and really through most of the second because we spent most of the second playing the way the first ended with that, with that two-goal lead. Um, and then it just went bang, bang from there right at the, right at the end of the second period. Absolutely right. 18-15 mark in the uh, second period. Ray Fust uh, gets on the board, puts UNO up 4-1. to one. Uh, Krenzen and Abgrohl had the assist. Uh, Krenzen did a terrific job moving the puck around our offensive zone to make that opportunity happen. And then 13 seconds later, our captain, Nolan Sullivan, gets the goal with assist to Joe LeMay and Jacob Gavin. I missed recording that goal, Jason, because it was 13 seconds later. Your wife had come back uh, from out in the concourse and she was sitting next to me. And I was I was showing her after the uh, first goal how I was taking time to label with a timestamp which goal was which. So organizing it for this podcast would be a lot easier and Sullivan scored so sorry Nolan I missed uh, getting your goal for this week's uh, episode of the podcast but UNO was up five to nothing going into the third obviously we both felt good at that point it was a good start for UNO I guess I was a little worried Jason I don't know how you felt about this but a lot of times when you have a series like this where you come out on Friday night and you put up a lot of points I was concerned that they weren't going to have any goals left for Saturday well and I would I would say that with, you know, with what we've talked about in the past podcast leading into the season, right? Like this was, I had plenty of people telling me like, oh, you know, what about that no offense for Omaha? I'm like, yeah, well, it's one game. I mean, yeah, (laughs) you can't, you can't say like everything's solved here because we found a way to, you know, put up a 10 spot on someone. You know, I think it goes a long way to say that there's potential here for this team. And that's what we saw on Friday. Um, but the question was going to be is, can you carry that through? Because you know Niagara is going into their Saturday morning meetings and in the locker room after the game on Friday and saying, it's not our best effort. We didn't play the game we wanted to play. We got trapped into this. You know, all these things that they could have done better. And they were going to come out on Saturday, you know, a different team ready to go. Um, and And so can we make those adjustments? Can we still you know, be effective in the offensive zone. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I don't think we were, like, I think Saturday was a totally different game from UNO's perspective, not just Niagara playing better, but I don't think we played as well on Saturday as we played on Friday. UNO capped uh, the game in the third period, 39 seconds in, Joe LeMay uh, gets the sixth goal for UNO. Uh, at the 902 mark, Tyler Rollwagon puts UNO up seven to one, and then uh, transfer from uh, Notre Dame, Jesse Lansdell uh, gets a goal at the 1240 mark in the third period, and UNO goes on to win the Friday night game, eight to one. Uh, as we said, a great showing, but we were nervous going into that Saturday night game. I should point out uh, that uh, going into the Saturday night game, Niagara defenseman Lane Brockhoff. Uh, was issued a one-game suspension for uh, his charging penalty in the game against UNO's Mike Abgrohl. Uh, what did you think of that whole sequence uh, toward the end of uh, the third period when uh, Abgrohl got hit by uh, by uh, the Niagara player? Like, I'm not going to call the kid out for it. You know, it's, it's tough being in that situation. Like, you came in last year, you beat this team, you're getting pummeled, 
Like, that wasn't just like an 8-1, you know, pucks didn't bounce our way kind of thing. Like, that was... They got beat by UNO. Like, got beat, beat by UNO. Um, we came out with a chip on our shoulder and just never really let Niagara get a foothold on anything, um, which is really what we needed to see from UNO. So there's some frustration with that coming, you know, from the team in general. I told someone else, I said, if he makes that exact same play at the end of the second period instead of the end of the third period, I don't think it's a suspension. I don't know if it's even a major. It might be a five minute, but I don't think they would have given him a game of misconduct. Like, I think it was the fact that that game was out of hand. The player was not in a position where, you know, he was really a threat to run up the score again or anything like that. Like, it was just, you had no reason to to make contact at that point in time with, with the situation the way it was. And that's really what he got penalized for was just a uh, not knowing where the game was. Um, you know, I'm glad that that it didn't result in anything worse. You know, those are the types of hits that sometimes can um, bring in contact to the head kinds of conversations and and that. And so, you know, we don't have concussions as far as we know. Um, and and he played the next night, so we don't have you know that's a good sign at least. So I'm just I'm just glad that it could have been worse and it wasn't. So going into Saturday night, we were without senior forward Matt Miller, and we were also out with a grad student Don Vidoli, who we mentioned earlier. Uh, 4:44 into the first period, sophomore defenseman Griffin Ludke gets the scoring started and also gets his first collegiate goal. It's kind of cool that the Ludke brothers get their first collegiate goals on back-to-back nights. Um, his shot came off of a rebound from uh, from Zach Ertl, who had uh, put the puck on net. UNO's up one to nothing at that point, Jason, but uh, 5-14, 30 seconds later, Noah Carlin for uh, Niagara ties things up. And it was, uh, it was knotted up for a long time in this game, Jason. That was the kind of game that, that we expected right like that Saturday was more what I thought we'd get two games of which was close games lots of back and forth both teams having opportunities you know pretty heavy hitting like there was a there was a lot of physicality to that game um, which you know especially for freshmen coming in like welcome to the NCHC welcome to NCAA hockey it's not like juniors it's not like where you played before Uh, and so hopefully that bodes well you know, going down the down the stretch and further into the season for UNO, it's a character building game, as coaches will call it a lot. You know, like the, you you learned how to play a tight game where, you know, you would normally grip your stick a little bit. Um, I think we kind of shot ourselves in the foot a lot. Like we had a lot of good opportunities that we made bad plays. We made bad passes. We were, I don't know what it was with this weekend. It worked on Friday, didn't work on Saturday, but there was a lot of these like blind backhanded passes, uh, you know, and I know they're meant to be like little escape routes and stuff, but like get your head up and make like make an appropriate play and not just, you know, wing the puck around. And, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that Niagara saw that on Friday and said, we can capitalize on some of those. And so those are the types of things that UNO needs to clean up. Uh, as they move forward in the season. Uh, really, the game turned in the third period. It was a five-minute major on Niagara, 8.49 into the third that opened things up for UNO. Uh, sophomore defenseman Joe LeMay gets the game-winning goal, and he shot the thing from the First National Bank logo, Jason. Um, it was about halfway through the period. Um, assist to Jacob Gavin and Ty Mueller. Um, It looked from our seats initially to me, because obviously things move fast, like uh, Ray Fust, who was standing in front of the crease, got uh, a piece of that. But uh, Joe LeMay gets the game-winning goal, and UNO goes on to win 2-1. to UNO very nearly scored a third goal during that five-minute power play. Coach Gabinette said in the post-game presser, he thought UNO looked more consistent on Saturday night. Certainly, it wasn't the offensive performance of Friday night, uh, but... uh, but we'll take him at his word, Jason. <laughs> Thing his word. Uh, great to get the sweep to start the season, considering how last season ended 
uh, and the fact that Brad Schloss, who's the North Dakota beat writer for the Grand Forks Herald, pointed out that if we had swept Niagara last season, we would have made the NCAA tournament. Um, good tone setter. Uh, the players were really, you could tell, excited about this series, wanted to get off on a good foot. Any final thoughts on this uh, first series uh, for UNL? Goaltending, we really didn't talk about it, you know, our goaltending much, but we had, we got to see both uh, Lacosi and Isley uh, in net this weekend. Both of them looked looked solid. Um, I don't, you know, I don't envy the coaches because, quite honestly, like I could see both of them, you know, being reliable backstops for you and know. So that that's a you know that's a positive thing whenever you're heading into a season to always have that kind of um, play by your guys. Um, you know I think we still we still have the questions right. Like I know you see an eight spot on Friday and you want to say like oh you know we've got the the offense solved we know where it's going to come from like you know it it, it you're not going to put that up, you know, that kind of game that we played on Saturday is not going to work against North Dakota. It's not going to work against Denver. And you're not going to have the kind of opportunities that we had on Friday against North Dakota and against Denver. So, um, you know, they've got to find a way to, I guess, marry the two, uh, you know, be more consistent the way coach wants us to play on Saturday, but be more efficient uh, in that, you know, and capitalize on the power play. I think we were two for 13 I think on the weekend between the two games and it's like you, you know you got to get one you know each game when you have that many opportunities but you know we need to be clicking at closer to a 20 percent rate um if if we want to contend because you're going to rely a lot on those kinds of opportunities in in the offense and the the flow the the uh momentum from those kinds of power plays even when you don't score uh, and so we need to be more work on that. Some in practices, find a way to capitalize on those opportunities more efficiently. Yes, you are correct. Two for 13 on the power play this weekend. So they need to be a little bit more um, efficient on that. They were five for five on the penalty kill. Jason, we got to turn to our players of the week. Lots of players uh, to consider this weekend. Uh, who did you like as your player of the week? Well, there's a there. I was thinking like this is hard because there's a lot of guys that that I liked even on Saturday. When you look at Saturday's game, there's guys that are not on the score sheet even that you kind of start thinking like, oh man, they you know played pretty good. I'll go with someone who was on there, but I think he's really kind of the rock on the the defensive core. Uh, Mancini's game was really nice. I thought uh, you know he he had a couple really big hits. He had one in the uh, a neutral zone entry uh let's see here that would have been saturday second period and just he timed it right he waited for the player to accept the pass and then just led with that push straight through the player and i mean the crowd the crowd really got into it they love to see those big hits you know is a clean play he didn't lead with a shoulder to catch a head or anything like that didn't catch a player that was in an, an awkward position just you know, separated him from the puck the way that, you know, they're taught all the way through youth hockey and up through college. So, you know, it's plays like that that don't necessarily show up on the score sheet that that most fans will look at. Uh, but I got to imagine that between the locker room, guys responding to him, uh, the leadership that he shows on the ice, I've seen him kind of directing play, telling guys where to go and stuff. And you know, we're going to need more of that coming into the season. And I really appreciate the effort that he put in this weekend. Yeah, terrific performance by Victor Mancini. I completely agree on that. Uh, two assists this weekend. Just a really terrific all-around defenseman right now for UNO. And like you said, we're going to need his leadership as the season progresses. It's those guys who you don't see on the stat sheet that are sometimes the most impressive. Um, I'm going to go with uh, junior forward Zach Erdahl, who transferred to UNO from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Coach Gabinette told us uh, a few weeks ago at the Herd at Sports Maverick All Access event out at the Herd at Sports Bar in uh, uh, Southwest Omaha uh, that they had actually uh, been uh, looking at Zach Erdahl before he uh, committed to uh, Wisconsin 
uh, several years ago. So it's nice to see him land at UNO, get a second chance here, and it's nice to see him get a good start for the team. One goal and an assist uh, on the weekend. Uh, as I mentioned before, a uh, former uh, former player with the Lincoln Stars in the USHL. So uh, fans uh, in this part of the country are familiar with him. Uh, it was good to see a transfer uh, a transfer student get off to a good start. And uh, he was also uh, impressive and was a factor uh, up at uh, Mankato in that exhibition uh, last weekend uh, that you and I uh, were up there for. So, so yeah, great player of the week pick, Jason. Uh, it's fun as we get into the season to pick some of these guys uh, because the team is so balanced offensively uh, and defensively and our goaltending is, uh, is looking solid here early on. Uh, there's a lot of interesting options to pick. But turning to our things, things you missed miss. at Baxter, Baxter Arena. Arena. And I got to tell you, Jason, last season they were really good about throwing all kinds of interesting wrinkles in the game day presentation. And there weren't as many this weekend. And I, I got to be honest with you, I'm a little worried they're not going to be serving us up interesting stuff to talk about this season. So hopefully this will be a regular segment. Uh, but we have a couple things to talk about Uh I don't know if you were in your seat and noticed this before both games, uh, Friday and Saturday nights, uh, they had flaming baton twirlers on the ice before the team skated out for player introductions. Did you see the flaming baton twirlers, Jason? I saw them on Saturday. I did not see them on Friday. Did you, did you like, do you like the flaming batons coming out? I, I don't care. Like keep it or not, like it's not, you know, it's not something that like there are some things teams do that I just like I just don't understand. This is just kind of one of those that like I just it doesn't move the needle either direction for me. Fair enough, Jason. Um, I am always a proponent of lighting things on fire, so uh, so I hope the flaming baton twirlers uh, stay. I hope they had more than just two flaming baton twirlers. Let's. Let's get a whole See, row. John wants that. John wants to put them on skates and have them like skate around, throwing the batons in the air and catching them. I see where you're going. <laughs> I will. I will tell you, it's amazing when you go to some of those uh, Minnesota schools to watch collegiate hockey, and they have the skating cheerleaders. It's been my long time wish uh, that we could get uh, the cheerleaders out there on ice skates. Uh, we will have to see if that happens as the season progresses. The other thing you may have missed uh, was during the first intermission on Saturday night, uh, the UNO Athletic Department honored the 2011 wrestling team that won the national championship in uh, 2011 out in uh, Kearney, Nebraska that year. After they won the national title, uh, it was announced that UNO was cutting football and wrestling along with moving uh, all of the rest of the sports to Division I. Obviously, hockey was Division I from the get-go in 97, but uh, there was a lot of controversy about cutting the wrestling program the same day that they won the national championship back in 2011. ESPN came to town and did a feature on it. Coach Denny, who built a really solid wrestling program during his tenure at UNO, ended up moving the program down to a university in Missouri. What did you think of this, Jason? What did you think of honoring this? It was a long time coming for the team. They had a reception for the team during the day uh, at Sap Fieldhouse before this uh, game at Baxter Arena. What did you think about them? finally honoring uh, the team's uh, national championship. It seems good to me. I heard comments both ways from fans in the stands and stuff. You know, some people were, were still, uh, still upset. And, you know, this whole event seemed a little bit kind of late to the party, salt in the wound kind of thing. Um, you know, I just think that some people have a, they're much more connected to the program, to the school and stuff than, you know, me coming from the outside. And so like, it's hard for me to really have a, a an opinion on this because that was like really early on when we started going to, uh, to games and stuff. And so like, I guess I just, I just don't really have 
kind of an opinion, but I can say like there was a lot of I'd say it's it's a lot of like mixed 50 50 kind of uh, comments. And I think some people were really happy that they were finally doing it and just glad that they they recognize it. But I also think that some people just uh, really felt like the whole way that it happened or, you know, the fact that they felt they had to get rid of uh, wrestling as a whole and instead of, you know, finding a way to move that to D1 or keep that program somehow. Um, just kind of was really uh, an unfortunate thing for those players. But um, what did you think? Like, you know, you've been around this longer. You've been around UNO, your alumni. You know, what was your opinion on it? There are emotions um, all over the spectrum on this. One of the more interesting reactions was the couple who was sitting behind us on Saturday night, I think was just confused as to what was going on and why we were honoring a team from 12 years ago. Because there are a number of people who I just think are not familiar uh, with what happened. When you look back at UNO throughout the 1990s, really before hockey uh, was added uh, to UNO athletics, there were a lot of struggles in the athletic department. They didn't have a lot of identity within the community. But one of the bright spots was this wrestling program that was consistently successful for UNO. And uh, it was something that was talked about in the community, not, you know, not like People talk about Husker football, Creighton basketball, or UNO hockey, but it was one of those things that was kind of a feather in the athletic department's cap. I completely understand the decision by the AD at the time, Trev Alberts, to eliminate football and wrestling. I don't know what kind of inner workings or politics were going on in the athletic department that may have prompted that decision, but certainly it's a it's a raw point. And, uh, and the fact that they won the national championship right as the decision was announced uh, made a big difference. It might've been better to have informed the program that you were cutting wrestling maybe before the wrestling season started, maybe not. So obviously Adrian Dowell uh, is trying to do his due diligence and rectify some uh, wrongs from the past, but I, I thank you for your perspective, Jason. <laughs> Little perspective as I have on that. <laughs> we are not we are not a wrestling podcast. We're all about hockey here. So um, we obviously have tunnel vision. <laughs> One of the interesting things at Baxter Arena that really isn't a thing you missed at Baxter Arena, but it was something that affected a lot of season ticket holder this weekend's were some of the technological woes that went on with the Omaha Mavericks app that they just released a new version a few weeks ago, transferring tickets from the app to your digital wallet on your smartphone, be it iPhone or an Android phone. People were confused because they didn't have QR codes on the digital tickets like they had last year, but some people like Jason, their tickets just didn't work. Jason, would you like to talk about the tickets? Because <laughs> listening to you and following online all of your woes, and for those who don't know, Jason works in technology, so this is like his life. So it was really surprising the issues that he faced with the tickets, but there are some reasons behind that. We had an issue with the ticket on Friday night, but it was operator error. For some reason, I loaded Saturday night's tickets into my iPhone, but I had not loaded Friday night's tickets into my iPhone. So there but you go. You load all your tickets into one phone, right? Yes, I load them. Yeah, I load them. And I will tell you up until this season, Bridget would just print out the tickets. She preferred that. This year, they don't allow printing of tickets, which I don't know why they don't allow them. But regardless, Jason, what kind of issues did you face? And just for people knowing, Jason is on the latest iPhone 15 Pro Max with iOS 17.0.3 running on his phone. And you had some issues with your tickets. Yeah, I had quite a few issues. And, you know, it's frustrating because as someone who knows the inner workings and uses these things a lot, like, having to deal with customer service at Ticketmaster is excruciatingly painful because, you know, their, their thing is like, they're like, okay, well, you know, it must be a user problem. I'm like, no, it's not a user problem. Like your software sucks. You have to fix this. And it's like, okay, well, you have to go to the website and do these steps. And I'm like, yeah, but if I go to the website, I wasn't getting anything. Like I'd see my list of tickets 
and I tap on the ticket that I want to add, and then I just get a white screen, you know, and it says that it's done loading, but there's nothing there. And so I like, I tell the ticket guy and I send him screenshots, like, this is what I'm seeing and it's not working. And they're like, oh, well, that's a, that's because you're on Ticketmaster. You need to go to the app and you can only use the app. So I have to go to the app. But if I go to the app and I try to add the ticket from the app, it would go into my wallet and it would say that it was activating. And then like an hour and a half later, it would say that it wasn't eligible. Like it, it was, it was not active because it was tied to a different iCloud account. But there's no one, in, there's nowhere in the, the UNO app that I can connect my iCloud account to my Ticketmaster or to my UNO account. There's nowhere in Ticketmaster that would let me do that. Um, and as you know, I have tickets to NHL games. And so like I have the NHL app, which is all the same kind of system that's all connected to a different Ticketmaster account. So I don't doubt that there would be some confusion in their system, but it's like, you can't get anyone to really at Ticketmaster to really kind of just like stop and listen to you. And they just kept feeding me back to the same thing. It was try the website. No, it's then you have to do it through the app, but the app doesn't work. So try the website. But we just went through this. The website doesn't work. And it's like so frustrating, you know, and I commend the, you know, Derek at, at UNO for you know, making sure that he could like, he printed my ticket so I could make sure that I could get in on Friday night. Um, and I sent him screenshots and video of everything. And, you know, him and I have talked about like getting together. <laughs> I gave it to John. Souvenir. <laughs> uh, you know, we talked about getting together and stuff and we're going to try to contact Ticketmaster and see if we can figure this out. Um, because it is a problem. Because the other issue we had was that um, our my oldest daughter was coming later to the game. And what we would do last year is we just logged into the account and we would download the ticket to her wallet. So her, her seat would be on her wallet. And my seat's always on my wallet because sometimes I'm there early, sometimes I'm there late. And, you know, we're just not always together as a family. And, and so like it worked out well that, you know, not all of our tickets had to be on one person's phone where everyone has to be there at the same time to get scanned in. Um, and like, it's just, they've got to do better. And I don't know if it's a Ticketmaster thing or a UNO thing. And my guess is it's probably a little bit of both, but it's like UNO is willing to say like, well, we got to figure this out. We'll get this fixed. And like Ticketmaster's like, I don't know, whatever, you know, good luck to you. And it's like so frustrating. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it definitely sounds frustrating, Jason. So I got to ask: Are you uh, are you finally ready to to jump on board with me and go back to having paper tickets after your experience? This is this I mean, is my one opportunity here. You know, <laughs> you know, a few years back when they went away from the paper tickets, they transitioned to a credit card type ticket that had a QR code, and I you and I had actually talked about those on the very first season. I can't remember if the first season we did the podcast, the 2018, 19 season was the first season they had those or not. Cannot remember. It might have been, um, they had those credit card tickets for two seasons and then a number of fans. And I think your in-laws were, were even told this UNO was considering going back to paper tickets and then COVID happened and things didn't end up going that direction. So I don't know what the thought process was there. I'm still a little confused why they don't have the ability to print out the paper tickets since they were able to print out your ticket at the box office. Um, I know some people have suggested that it's because they're worried about like fraud, people selling fake tickets or something. I mean, my well, philosophy, my, it's a Ticketmaster my, thing. Ticketmaster has been for for many years. They have been fighting fraudulent tickets and scams and illegal tickets and fake tickets. And, you know, they used to have a QR code that was tied to your account where it was your QR code and it would just scan it and it recognize the tickets that were in your account. Um, but those things can be easily, like you can take a picture of that and use that. And so they had a lot of problems with, with security at events and stuff. 
um, with those types of things. So I, I understand like that, that push to go digital because you can control the security of it uh, to a greater extent than you can with a paper ticket. Um, and so they're trying to leverage the cost of the contract with Ticketmaster with this, like if we don't have to print tickets, we're saving on paper and ink and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I can see how like they wouldn't want to um, print off tickets all the time, but I, if they can't, honestly, if they can't get this figured out, like where as a family of four, like if we can't be able to have our tickets on different, you know, different devices, if there isn't a way to do that, then yeah, we've got to go back to paper tickets because this does not work for fans. And this doesn't even get into the fact that Android users couldn't access their tickets at all until like two or three days before the event. Like when they first rolled it out, it worked on iPhone, but didn't work for anyone else. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, it. And again, I I don't want to sound like that guy who's in favor of going back to paper tickets. I and I again, I understand wanting to avoid fraud, but until this is not a Taylor Swift concert here. And until you can, you know, convince me that there is some, you know, massive, you know, UNO hockey ticket counterfeiting ring going <laughs> where people are manufacturing tickets, um, you know, it, it's interesting. But yes, you're absolutely right. The Android users were having problems transferring their tickets at all. Now, what I typically do, because I really don't want to have another app on my phone if I don't have to. I just log into Safari on my phone and then just transfer the tickets from my MyMavs account on the OMAVS website there, which I think is pretty much the same thing uh, with doing it from the app. One interesting note on the app, it looks like Sidearm Sports, who is the entity that's behind the NCHC uh, TV app uh, that we watch NCHC games on during the season is behind both of the apps. And there've been a lot of issues with the NCHC TV app. So I don't know if there's any relation with the software teams with this or not, but hopefully Jason, uh, your tickets get figured out because I know how much you enjoy uh, using the digital tickets on your phone. Uh, so we'll be interested to get an update after you've met with UNO and talked with Ticketmaster and done whatever kind of voodoo needs to be done to get those things working. So we're turning to our Ohio State series. We play uh, the Ohio State Buckeyes October 27th and 28th at Baxter Arena. Both of those games will start at 7.07 p.m. Get a little bit of a break. Hopefully get Matt Miller, Dom Vidoli uh, rested up, healed up, and uh, back in the lineup. Former UNO assistant Steve Rollick uh, is the head coach uh, at Ohio State. Uh, he was one of the original uh, assistants under UNO coach Mike Kemp when the program started. A really, really good guy. Uh, recruited some terrific players uh, to UNO like Jeff Hogan. Uh, he's had a lot of success uh, for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Fans will recall that uh, Steve Rollick was actually a finalist for the UNO head coaching job uh, back in 2009. And I had heard at the time he actually had the job, but uh, Trev Alberts decided to take another run at Dean Blaze, uh, and the rest is history. Uh, Ohio State is 2-0-1 on the season. Uh, they beat Mercyhurst to start the season uh, and got a win and a tie against Lindenwood, one of the new upstart programs there. Um, Jason, what do you think going into this Ohio State series? You know, Big Ten hockey's come a long way the past few years. It used to be that it was Michigan, Michigan State, and then we forgot about who else was in there. You know, Minnesota was down for a long time. They're coming back. Uh, you know, they, they're they shaping up to be a lot like the NCHC, where it's just going, they know they're going to have trouble. They know it's going to be, you know, a long grinding conference play in the second half of the season. And so just like UNO, they're looking at their non-conference games and saying, you know, we need wins here. They're going to come in ready to play and we're going to have to be ready to play. Their style of play is somewhat similar to ours. They, they play a lower level game, a, uh, you know, grind it out, kind of rely on their defense. Their goaltending is pretty good. 
they don't have a lot of flashy goal scorers. I think they're going to be close, hard fought games, even with them struggling against Lindenwood last weekend. Um, you know, their win wasn't a, wasn't an impressive win. It was just, they ground out a, a W uh, and then their tie was, I mean, you got up by two and you couldn't close them out. Uh, you know, that that's, I'm sure got their coaching staff concerned. And so UNO needs to be ready for Ohio state coming in with a, a chip on their shoulder and saying like, we've got to show that we're better than what we look like in Lindenwood. And we certainly can't let UNO sweep us otherwise <laughs> that could end up being the reason why we don't make it we you and o knows that because <laughs> you just pointed out yeah absolutely right and you know for fans like the two of us who've talked about you and o playing uh some tougher higher profile non-conference teams this is certainly a great opportunity for the team so uh so we hope that uh, UNO takes advantage uh, of the opportunity. Uh, players to watch, uh, senior forward Stephen Halliday was their leading scorer last season. Um, sophomore forward Davis Burnside currently leads the teams with three goals and an assist. Um, junior goalie Logan Turnis, a uh, transfer from UConn, uh, has played all three games for the Buckeyes this season, and he currently has a 2.28 goals against average and a .909 save percentage. Uh, they have four players with four points this season uh, currently, uh, so they've they've got some offensive prowess there. Um, this was an NCAA tournament team last season. Uh, they lost to eventual uh, national champion uh, Quinnipiac in the Bridgeport Regional. So this is a great opportunity for UNO uh, to get reacquainted with a team that they used to play all the time back in the uh, CCHA days in the early years of the program. Jason, does UNO sweep? Do they split? Do they get swept by the Buckeyes? How do you think they're going to do? I'm going to hedge my bet and say that we split it. I think, like I said, I think Ohio State's going to come in. I expect their best effort on Friday. I, uh, you know, I think that it's going to be a close game. Uh, I think they have a little bit more, I don't know, like not so much offense. Like I think they're more balanced than we are. They're more consistent in their play from top to, from their first line to their fourth line for sure. Um, and I think that they're going to give UNO a lot to handle on Friday. So I could see them, you know, eking out a 4 2, 3 2 kind of victory. Uh, on Friday but I think that Saturday we come back we make adjustments and you know UNO plays better and and finds a way to win a close game on Saturday Um, and I say close because I could see it going a sweep for Ohio State or a sweep for UNO you know if we come out and play uh, you know run them style like we played Niagara on Friday I don't think it's unheard of to say that UNO can beat Ohio State in both games um, I think we have better goaltending than they do. And if we can make sustained pressure and, and put, um, you know, 30, 33 to 38 shots on Ohio State, that that could be trouble for Ohio State. You know, the week off that we have next weekend, I think is actually going to be a factor in this series. It does give the coaching staff some time to work on some things, but... Uh, Ohio State uh, travels to Ann Arbor, Michigan to take on the Michigan Wolverines, which uh, that's always a tough place to play uh, when you're a visiting team. Bridget and I uh, went and watched UNO play up there many moons ago. I know how difficult it is, and I think that Ohio State's going to come in really seasoned and really tested from that series. So I think we're going to lose on Friday night, and then I think uh, we're going to rebound, uh, make adjustments, and come back uh, and play tough on Saturday night. So we could sweep. We could get swept. You just never know. It should be an interesting series. Uh, We both would encourage you to get out for those games. I'm sure UNO will have plenty of tickets available. I'm sure that they'll be running some uh, ticket promotions, ticket discounts to get people in the stands. So be sure to take advantage of those things and come out for both of those games on uh, the 27th and 28th at Baxter Arena. If you can't come in person, you can listen to the game uh, on 1290 Coil. Uh, You can also watch the games on NCHC TV. 
if you're at the game or if you're watching on TV, of course, Bridget will be live tweeting uh, both of those games as she always does. And you can find links to all of our social media channels, including that Twitter account at mavpuck.com. So we encourage you uh, we encourage you to follow us on all of the platforms. So Jason, until next time, go Mavs. Go Mavs. Thank you.